Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's briefing. Um, I want to start, as I always do, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, I can confirm that there have been 10,521 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 197 uh, from yesterday. A total of 1,762 patients are currently in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of 27 uh, from yesterday. A total of 134 uh, people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of one since yesterday. I should say at, at this point that despite these uh, occasional fluctuations, overall these statistics for hospital and intensive care admissions uh, still give us cause for cautious optimism. Uh, I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, uh, a total of 2,380 patients who had tested positive for the virus have now been able to leave hospital and I wish them well. On a much sadder note, I have to report that in the last 24 hours, 13 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus. And that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,262. It is worth highlighting again, indeed it's important that I do so, that although people can now register deaths on Sundays, we do know that from recent weeks that the figures that we report on Mondays of deaths which were uh, registered on a Sunday tend to be relatively low. And that means the figure I report tomorrow uh, may be significantly larger than today's. And of course, once again, I want to stress and indeed reflect on uh, the fact that the numbers I read out here every day are not just statistics. They are individuals whose loss is a source of grief and distress to family and friends. So once again, I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. And I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers who continue to do extraordinary work in the most difficult of circumstances. And again, place on record uh, my thanks to essential workers the length and breadth of the country uh, whose dedication each and every day is helping to keep vital services running. Tomorrow on International Workers Memorial Day, the Scottish Government will join a minute's silence at 11am to honour those frontline workers particularly, uh, though of course not exclusively, health and care workers who have sadly lost their lives while working to tackle this pandemic. I invite all of you at home and uh, those taking part in essential work across the country to join us at that time tomorrow. The silence will provide an opportunity to pay tribute to those who have died as a result of their work to serve, care for and save others. And it will be a further reminder that of all the duties uh, government bears during a situation like this, uh, the most vital is our obligation to help keep care and health workers safe. And I want to stress again today that I and the Scottish Government uh, are acutely aware of that responsibility and will work each and every day to do everything we can to fulfil that obligation. Now, I have two things I want to comment on this morning. Uh, and the first really is to reflect a little bit more on some of the statistics I have just reported. I know that it might not feel this way since the numbers that I am reporting each day, particularly those on the number of people who are dying, are always far higher than we want them to be. But it is nevertheless the case that we are now seeing some real signs of progress. The number of people in intensive care has fallen by around a third in the last fortnight from the figure I would have reported to you two weeks ago today. The number of people in hospital, uh, which was rising sharply in the first 10 days of this month, has also now broadly stabilised and the trend uh, there may also now be a downward one. Our NHS, while working incredibly hard and in the most difficult of circumstances, has not been overwhelmed, which just a few weeks ago we really feared that it might be. 
Of course, we're not yet seeing a definite fall in the number of people who are dying each day from the virus. However, as we've always said, because of the way the illness progresses, that will be the last uh, daily number that we do start to see decline, and we hope to see that uh, in the uh, next couple of weeks. But we do have evidence that the actions that all of us, all of you watching at home, are taking are making a real and a positive difference. Your efforts are working. So again today, I want to thank you uh, for that. However, uh, and I realise that this is a, a less welcome and much more uh, difficult point for me to make, this progress remains very fragile. And now is a time for all of us to exercise careful caution. It is certainly not a time to throw caution to the wind. The margins we think we are working within in respect to the reproduction number, that crucial R number that I spoke about last week, are very narrow. At this stage, even a slight easing up in the restrictions in place now could send the reproduction rate back towards or above one, and the virus would then start to spread very quickly again. Within days of that, all of the indicators that are suggesting progress now would start to go in the wrong direction again. That would mean more cases, more hospital and intensive care admissions, and sadly, more deaths. So for all our sakes, and to protect the progress that together we've made, all of the restrictions currently in place need to remain in place for now. The job is not done yet. We need you to stay the course for a bit longer. Of course, we are now thinking about the ways in which we can begin to ease the lockdown a bit when it is safer to do so, although we can't yet put dates on any of that. And as I said last week, lifting lockdown will not be a flick of a switch moment. We will instead be considering gradual and careful variations. But it is important and necessary uh, to do that work now, and we are doing that work now. And as I said last week, I think it is really important to engage you in that work in an open and transparent way. So I can confirm that in the coming days, I will say more about the different options under consideration and how we are going about assessing those. But let me stress again that the current restrictions are still in place. We have to stick with them for now in order to be able to relax things in future. As well as the impact on all of us as individuals, I absolutely understand the anxieties of business and I am acutely aware of the social and health impacts of economic damage. But let me make this point. A premature easing up on these restrictions, if it led to the virus running out of control again, would not help your business or the economy. In fact, it would make the economic damage even worse. So that's why I'm asking businesses uh, as well as individuals to continue to do the right things, as indeed the vast majority of you have been doing already, for which you have my deep gratitude. So if you're a business on the list of those required by law to close, then obviously you should remain closed. But if you're not in that category, but chose to close voluntarily at the start of lockdown and are now thinking of reopening, our view is that you should not contemplate doing so unless you can comply fully with existing guidance and are able to change your working practices to ensure safe social distancing at all times. The precautionary principle that I've spoken about before still applies for the protection of your workers and for your customers. And for all of us, uh, not just businesses, if you're now going out and about a little bit more than you were at the start of the lockdown, then you really shouldn't be because you might be putting yourselves and your loved ones at risk. Fundamentally, the basic restrictions of lockdown continue to apply. You should only leave home for essential purposes like buying food or medicine or exercising. If you do leave the house, you should stay two metres apart from other people and not meet up with people from other households. And you should wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. As I say every day, I know that all of this is difficult and I know that it gets more difficult with every day that passes, but it remains essential. As I've said many times and again today, any easing up right now would risk us seeing the virus surge upwards again. So please, please stick with it so that we can continue to make progress together and accelerate, hopefully, the stage at which we can begin a process of restoring some normality to our lives. Now, the other issue I want to very briefly update on relates to skills. 
Skills Development Scotland have updated their My World of Work website to help people find free courses. Uh, this new service has been developed with the support of the Open University in Scotland and it highlights free courses run by 12 providers in areas like digital technology, business studies and languages. In the coming weeks and months, we'll expand the range of courses available by working with colleges and universities. Uh, we're also working with the UK government and the other devolved administrations who are all developing similar initiatives in order to highlight the courses they offer. Now, I'm aware that doing courses like this may not seem like an option, may not be an option for everyone. If you have caring responsibilities or if you volunteer to help others, time to study might be pretty limited. But for some people, uh, maybe especially, though not exclusively, people who are currently furloughed or who have been made uh, unemployed, it could make sense to develop new skills during this period. So we hope that this initiative will help people to do that safely and free of charge. And it's a good example of the importance of digital public services. And I'm grateful to Skills Development Scotland for establishing this site so quickly. The courses are open to anyone. So if you are interested, uh, go to myworldofwork.co.uk where you'll find the free courses under the Learn and Train uh, section of the main menu. Uh, that concludes my update for today. Before I pass on to the Chief Medical Officer and then to the Health Secretary, I simply want to end by thanking again uh, each and every one of you for doing the right thing and staying at home. I know it's difficult, but it is, as I hope I've demonstrated today, also making a difference. The steps we are all taking are helping to slow the spread of this virus as we wanted to do. Uh, they are helping to protect the NHS as we wanted to do. And they are, notwithstanding uh, the figures I have to report to you every day, helping to save lives. Uh, so please uh, stick with them and thank you for doing so. Uh, I'll hand now briefly to Dr Greg Gregor Smith to say a word or two and then to the Health Secretary before we move on to questions. Thank you, First Minister. So I've spoken before about the need for people to come forward with urgent symptoms so that they get the clinical care that they need when they need it. This is especially important for symptoms like chest pain or when people experience a new weakness in the facial muscles, the limbs or difficulty speaking that might be suggestive of a stroke. When I've been speaking to colleagues over the weekend and again today, there's a feeling that it seems more people are attending with these type of symptoms. That's good. And it's important as these need to be assessed quickly so that they can be treated appropriately. Speed is of the essence here. And my message to you again is please don't delay seeking help if you experience these type of symptoms. If you do, my colleagues and I expect you to phone 999 so that we can help you as quickly as possible. I've also spoken about the need to speak to someone about new symptoms that may need to be assessed quickly to determine whether there is a suspicion of cancer or not. Symptoms like rapid, unintended weight loss, new or unusual bleeding, or the detection of a lump. These are all things that you shouldn't ignore, and I urge you to speak to your GP about it soon. But I also need your help today. When I've been speaking to colleagues, they've also told me that they've seen more cases of people presenting with trauma after accidents or risk-taking behaviours. I'm sure that many of these will be avoidable. As an example, there are more people using cycling as a way of travelling just now, and I make a plea to all road users, whether on a bike or in a car, to be especially mindful of each other on the road. Similarly, if you're tackling new projects at home or in the garden that you've been putting off until now, please take care and make sure that you're following all the guidance necessary when you're working at height or with electrical tools. Anything we can do together to reduce the impact on NHS services just now is appreciated and welcome. I'm grateful to you all for your continued support of the restrictions that are in place and want you to know that they're making a difference. We now need to ensure that everyone who needs care is receiving it, not just those with COVID-19, and that the avoidable injuries and trauma that necessitate treatment are kept to a minimum for everybody's sake. So I want to emphasise once again, if it was urgent before COVID-19, it remains urgent now. Please know that your NHS remains open for you and is ready to help you when you need it. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, I'll hand over now to the Health Secretary. Thank you very much. I, I too want to say a few words about how the NHS is open and I want to focus particularly on primary care, on your GP practice and all the expertise that's available to you there. You'll remember that we established a very specific community pathway for those individuals who were experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. 
we created the special phone line 111, which would then uh, pass you on to a hub where you would get clinical expertise uh, assessing uh, your symptoms. And if necessary, you were then uh, made an appointment with a community assessment center. One of the uh, byproducts of that, very deliberately so, was not only about creating that special route for people with COVID-19 symptoms, but was also to free up your GP practice so that it could focus on the good work that it had always done before COVID-19 and after. And that practice remains there for you with all the expertise that it always had to answer and to deal with your health issues and health questions. It's also the case that we have expanded, as you know, community pharmacy and both your GP practices and community pharmacy will be open over the May bank holidays. So unusually, all those services will be available to you for use. Please do not think that you can't use them. Please do not think that you're troubling anyone. You are doing what we want you to do, which is where you've got a health issue or a concern and you would normally go to your GP or to your community pharmacy for their expert help and advice, please continue to do so. As we follow those important public health messages, your NHS in primary and acute and urgent remains open for you. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the Health Secretary. I'll now move straight to questions. Uh, first question comes today from Glenn Campbell from the BBC. First Minister, with Boris Johnson returning to work today, are you and he as one in your approach to lifting lockdown or are there differences? And if the UK hits its 100,000 test target later this week, what will Scotland's total contribution to that have been? Um, I'll say more about testing as the week develops. We are working in Scotland uh, on making sure the, the capacity uh, for tests uh, hits the 3,500 target that we set, and uh, I hope it will go beyond that. But more importantly, we're, of course, uh, working to ensure that the number of tests done in Scotland uh, meets that capacity and uh, is, is maximised and is done in the way that helps us with our overall uh, approach to tackling the virus. And obviously, tests in Scotland are done through NHS uh, laboratories and NHS schemes, but also we now have, as part of the UK-wide uh, system, the, the drive-through operation, which, of course, now has a, a digital portal uh, where people uh, can access more easily. So we'll uh, obviously give uh, more detail and, and more uh, report more numbers around that as we uh, go forward uh, this week and, indeed, beyond as we go into a, a test, trace, isolate uh, approach as part of our strategy for the next phase. Um, on the question, let me say, first of all, it's good to see Boris Johnson uh, back at work today, having recovered uh, from the virus. I'm sure uh, everybody will, will welcome that. Um, I think we are at one in wanting to see uh, this virus beaten, in wanting to see the number of uh, cases uh, reduce, the reproduction rate reduce as far below one as possible, and to make sure that whatever we do now moving from the position right now into um, a, a position where we start to ease up some of these restrictions, although I refer back to what I said about it being slow and gradual and, and not a flick of the switch uh, moment, that all of that uh, enables us to keep cases low and keep the reproduction uh, number below one. So I think we're all absolutely united in doing that. And the questions then of how you do that are secondary, and that is driven by Obviously, uh, the advice we get, but the judgments we make about the, the application of that advice. I, I've said now so many times, but it's worth uh, repeating, I think, that this, to me, is not driven in any way by political considerations or constitutional considerations. The only thing I care about is keeping uh, the damage that this virus can do to a minimum. And I will continue to base my decisions um, on uh, those considerations. And I'm sure uh, Boris Johnson will as well. Uh, Jim Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. Boris Johnson hailed the effort and sacrifice of the British public. Is the sacrifice all the greater for decisions taken by him and this country's political leaders? And second of all, I've been asked by the construction industry to relay a question, actually. If they can prove it's safe to go back to work, can they? And given your opening remarks, there are you saying to business in general 
look, if it's safe, if you can ensure social distancing, go back to work. It sounded like that. Can you clarify? Um, no, I, I'm not saying anything different in that respect to what I've been saying before. What I, I did in my opening remarks was point to the existing guidance. That guidance has not changed. Remember, I've set out before uh, the fact that there are a group of businesses that by law are required to close. At the other end of that spectrum, there are a group of businesses that are necessary to keep going so that we keep food on the table and, and the lights on in the country continues to run. In the middle, there are a number of businesses that have to make judgments about whether or not they can safely operate and the guidance that we have issued uh, to them on that has not changed. And uh, I want to be very clear about that. We will continue to engage directly with different businesses if they feel uh, a need for that and also with different sectors of the economy. And as we go through the process of uh, the next few weeks of looking to make certain changes, we will do that, as I said last week, in, a, in an open and transparent and discursive uh, way. Uh, and I think that's the, the right way to proceed. Uh, on the first part of your question, you know, all leaders uh, have been making the best decisions uh, that they uh, could based on the advice and applying uh, our judgment to that. Um, I've said before, I, I don't think there is, uh, there certainly, uh, I, I don't think there, there is and certainly shouldn't be, in my view, any government anywhere in the world that is declaring success or victory right now. Uh, we are not through this pandemic. Uh, perhaps we're not even uh, a significant part of the way through this pandemic. And it's really important that we remain focused on what we need to do going forward to continue to suppress this virus albeit as we try to get a semblance of normality back into our day-to-day -day lives. There will be uh, rightly and properly opportunities in the future to look back uh, in all countries and assess what was done, what was not done, in order to learn lessons from that. And as I say, that is, is right and proper. Uh, but for now, the most, in, in many ways, the toughest decisions still lie ahead of us. Uh, and it's really important that all of us remain focused on that, taking the best advice possible, but of course, as decision makers, um, using that advice to inform uh, the judgments that we make. Ross Govins from STV. Thanks, First Minister. Is it now time for some real clarity on the use of face masks or coverings in public as part of any exit strategy? And is the absence of guidelines and, frankly, the mixed messages from government just left people confused? Um, we intend to put some guidance out. I think I've uh, indicated this uh, before. We, we, we had an intention to put some guidance out. I hope we will be able to do that uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, which will uh, take account of the, the advice that we have on that, which is, I think it's fair to say, inconclusive. And, you know, the, the evidence base around wearing face coverings is not overwhelming. Uh, but as I've said before, and I've expressed sympathy before uh, with the position that Sadiq Khan in London um, has, has articulated, that in certain circumstances, um, you know, for example, in, in certain enclosed spaces where social distancing is not possible, there may be a benefit to covering your face. And we will put some guidance out to give people clarity um, around that. As I say, I, I would hope we would do that uh, tomorrow. Um, let me just make two additional points to that. Firstly, um, this is face coverings we're talking about, not medical masks. And I think it's really important to be clear about that. So we're talking about you know, scarves or, or bandanas, uh, not the, the masks that health and care workers would wear. And secondly, and this comes back to the point about the evidence around this, wearing a mask covering, a face cloth face covering in public is not a substitute for following the rest of the rules and advice. And, and that's the bit I think we've taken a bit of time so that we can be really clear about. It doesn't mean that you can ease up on the rules that are in place right now. Um, and that's really important because it doesn't, it doesn't confer enough protection or the certainty of enough protection uh, to substitute for the other things we're asking people to do. Uh, so as I say, we will uh, issue that guidance uh, shortly um, and hopefully that will give people uh, the, the greater clarity that they are looking for. Uh, Peter Smith from ITV News. Minister. Thank you very much, First, First Minister. Um, we're learning about this virus all the time and the information's changing. Indeed, the science seems to be changing as well. The, there was some reports from the WHO over the weekend questioning the immunity. Um, what can you please share with us? What is the Scottish government's current view of 
the robustness and length of time that people have immunity after having the virus, what's the current view on that um, for informing your strategy, and also the latest reports suggesting that there could be coronavirus-related illnesses being seen in children. What do we know about that, and how will that influence your decision to open schools? Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Gregor Smith to take uh, both of those points. I think very briefly from me, because it's, a, it's, it's an issue... I am acutely interested in, as, as all leaders will be, as we try to, to work our way through these decisions. On the immunity point, uh, the bottom line is there is no certainty yet whether or not this virus confers immunity once you've had it, and if it does, what the length, uh, the time span of, of that immunity will be. And, and clearly, uh, that uncertainty there has implications for you know, what we have talked about previously, about antibody tests or any you know, approaches in the longer term that might use uh, immunity certificates or anything like that. So it's one of, not the only uncertainty around this virus, but it is one of the key ones. Uh, and, you know, hopefully as time passes, we will get a deeper understanding of that. Gregor, do you want to take both of those points? Yeah, I, mean, I think the point you've made there about highlighting the, the emerging evidence here is, is, is really, really important because, as I've said on countless occasions, we are constantly learning um, about how this, this, this new virus behaves and, and, and exactly its impact on, on the community. And, th and this is a particular area uh, where, where there's, there's a little bit of growth in the evidence recently about, about actually what do we understand about how immunity um, is, is obtained to the virus and, and whether that's sustained over any length of period as well. That's partly helped by the fact that, that we're gradually getting better tests for the serology. That's the antibodies that we detect in people's bloods afterwards. But I, what I would caution here is that, that those tests are still not of the, the highest sensitivity yet for us to be able to speak with any degree of um, convincing authority as to what that um, uh, immunity is likely to be over a prolonged length of time. But gradually we're getting more information about this and, um, as I say, I think as, as those tests begin to mature and become much more reliable, we, we'll learn more about this uh, as well. The second point that you made was about the, the, the small number of cases that there have been of um, children presenting, um, particularly in um, the, the, the London area with, with um, various forms of complications from uh, potential exposure to COVID-19. This is very, very early case reports that we're starting to see um, and we're, we're comparing the experience around the world here. We know that in general there's many viruses which can cause similar types of syndromes in children and in the cases that have been identified here it's, it's important to note that not all of these children have tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19 as well. So again, this is an area of emerging evidence, one that we're learning from. And I think that we need to wait to see how this evidence begins to, to kind of emerge more fully before we predict exactly what the, the long-term consequences of that. But I would emphasize again, this is a very small number of children, really important that we learn about it, um, but, but, but um, more evidence is needed. Uh, and if final I, point can I, from can I just me. Ask, it did yeah. seem to be a slight change on the immunity though, just, just as recently as two weeks ago, we heard your National Clinical Director Jason Leach saying it appears that if you get the virus, you don't get it again. Has, has the science changed? I don't think the science has changed. I, I, I think that we don't yet know enough to say these things with certainty. And, and this is not something that will be different in Scotland to anywhere else in the world. That question of what uh, level and longevity of immunity is conferred once you've had this virus is simply still under under discussion and it's not something that we can say with certainty. Uh, you asked about, uh, I think in relation to the second point, what impact that has on some of our decision making. All I would say in general here, and I'm not uh, talking specifically about these two points of detail, uh, important though they are, but in general, the fact that this virus is still just over 100 days old, the fact that there is a lot we still don't know about it, also feeds into that uh, need to be really cautious as we take decisions uh, about the future. Uh, there are other reasons for that as well, as I've set out before, but some of this uncertainty means that we, we just need to be careful and considered uh, as we take these decisions for the future so that we're not having unintended consequences of, of things that we do. Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Um, First Minister, uh, you were asked yesterday about the possibility of a border between England and Scotland, and your reply was that you were in discussions with the UK government about that. Is that because you think it would be a good idea to have such a border and it might have some benefits in fighting this virus, 
or was it a misunderstanding and were you actually talking about the UK borders? And if that was the case, how would that work? Because there seems to be some lack of understanding as whether actually imposing a UK border would actually have any benefit. Well, when I answered the question yesterday, and this was a point put to me, it wasn't something I raised. I was actually talking about external, international UK borders, and actually I raised that point uh, standing here last Thursday when we published the paper. Um, and yes, there is difference of opinion. There's difference in terms of evidence about how effective that would be. But like many other countries are doing, as we go back into hopefully a containment phase, that has to be part of the the discussion uh, that we, we have about how we contain and keep the virus at, at very low levels. And, and these are discussions, obviously, given where the, the devolved reserve uh, power uh, split is on this that we continue to have to take, uh, uh, to have with, with the UK government. I mean, I have to say, um, <laughs> and I, I say this, uh, you know, in a sense, with, with a degree of regret, I, I think you would have had to really twist and exaggerate my response to that yesterday to get to some of the uh, headlines we see in some of the newspapers uh, today. Um, and again, I'll make a point here that I've made before. Um, my only interest right now is what we have to do to fight this virus. And anybody who is trying to use the, the immediate challenges we face in tackling this virus, or to twist what I say in uh, relation to some of these issues, to make any kind of pre-existing political or constitutional uh, point will not find me willing to play ball. This virus is still out there doing its damage. People are still being admitted to hospital. People are still being admitted to intensive care. People, sadly, are still dying. And that's why I come back to this point. The only thing that matters to me is taking the right action, whatever that might be, to try to tackle that and to reduce the harm that this virus is doing. And I know that doesn't necessarily translate into quite so dramatic headlines, uh, but that, I'm afraid, is the position. And for as long as we're dealing with this, that will continue to be the position that I take. Uh, Alan Zizinski from Global. Thank you very much, First Minister. We also heard the Prime Minister this morning talking about the importance of reaching out, bringing in opposition parties for talks more across all the four nations. Just wondering if you've spoken to him recently and if you think those comments mean devolved administrations could have more of a bigger influence on the UK-wide strategy as a whole going forward. And just also, he talked about the importance of the transparency behind those decisions too. How crucial is it for the public to be told what the science actually is that's being relied on? Will we start to see more detailed, more specific information about that science given out in the future? Well, on that latter point, I, I spoke last week about the importance of transparency as we take these decisions, because these decisions are, are uncertain, they're complex, there's no absolute rights and wrongs in any of this. And, you know, that's why I said and continue to believe it's important to have that adult grown up conversation with a lot of transparency around it. In terms of uh, this, this points about science in particular, I, uh, we have established here in Scotland our own advisory group, which uh, provides uh, an augmentation to the the, the advice that comes out of, of SAGE, the membership of that advisory group is, is published, the, the minutes of the meetings of that advisory group are published, and I think that is the, the right uh, way forward. Uh, but, you know, let me be clear about the relationship between science and decision making on, on the part of leaders. Uh, as a leader, it's my job to make the decisions and be accountable and held accountable for those decisions. But it's important that that is informed by the best scientific advice available because you know, if you don't inform your decision making uh, by the best science, then you end up standing at a podium suggesting that people should perhaps drink disinfectant uh, or inject disinfectant. As a leader, you have a duty to inform uh, your decision making with science, but that doesn't change the fact that you are the one making uh, the decisions. And I think it's really important that we understand that as we, we go forward. Um, in relation to have I spoken to uh, Boris Johnson, I've, I've not spoken to him yet since his return to work. He only uh, returned to work this morning. I'm sure there will be uh, conversations in, in the days ahead. Uh, the four nations continue to uh, cooperate and collaborate uh, through, in the main, the, the COBRA structure, although there are other discussions at different levels uh, out, out with that. And it's really important that that happens. I also think that as part of the overall discussion we're having, uh, opposition parties being involved in that, just as the public uh, must be involved in that, is important. I uh, have a, a weekly uh, discussion right now, which uh, 
takes place uh, with all of the, the opposition leaders here in Scotland, which is an opportunity for us to share where we are on certain things and for them to you know, ask questions and, and uh, deepen their own understanding of some of the, the challenges that we're facing. So I think it's important that that happens. My ministers will be having similar conversations with their counterparts in the other parties. So it's, we're all in this. It, it, the decisions we take here affect all of us, and therefore the, the, the wider and more inclusive we can take, uh, we can make these uh, decisions, the better. But that doesn't change the fact that in a democracy, it's government's responsibility to take the decisions um, ultimately and be held responsible and accountable for them. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Um, looking at the issue of testing, as the, as the capacity uh, continues to increase, we're still seeing a, a lot of spare capacity. There are calls for uh, the routine testing of health and care workers to give them an ongoing assurance to to relieve some of the anxiety that they're facing. So I was just wondering, is that something being explored? And if it was possible to introduce routine testing of health and care workers, how soon could that be done? Well, we are looking, we already have expanded the initial three categories uh, that we set for uh, our testing objectives. So we continue to look to see in line with how we are seeking to approach tackling this virus overall, we expand uh, that further. Uh, the one point I would make, which I've made previously, and it's not the same point, but it, it falls into the kind of a similar category to the immunity issue that was raised um, a couple of questions ago as, as an area of uncertainty, is that right now we, we don't know really for sure how reliable this uh, the testing is when people don't have symptoms. So we you know, there is evidence out there about uh, people who are asymptomatic, perhaps sharing virus, but we, we don't know yet that this test is really reliable. So we've got to be careful that when we are using testing, uh, we are not doing that in ways that could end up giving people false assurances about whether or not they've, they've had the virus. So all of these things need to continue to be considered and, and they will continue to be considered as we expand um, the use of the testing capacity that is building up all the time. Do you want to say anything about the efficacy of, of testing? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's really important that when we're considering how we use testing, that we use it to the best of our ability to provide useful information. So whether that's useful information to an individual or useful information in terms of giving us a sense of, of, of what things are from a population level, we just need to make sure that that testing is deployed um, in absolutely the, the, the correct way. And, and Public Health Scotland are, are assessing a variety of different ways that we can begin to increase the, the, the range of testing which, which may be on offer in a variety of different ways to allow us uh, a much better sense of, 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 of um, the, the kind of uh, point prevalence of, of the, uh, the virus within different populations within the country as well. And we expect that to, um, to, to, to be something we, we can introduce in, in the fairly near future. Okay, thanks. Uh, Katrine Bussey from PA. Good afternoon, First Minister. I also wanted to ask about testing, given that the target for increasing capacity to 3,500 is due to come in at the end of this week. Um, and the Health Secretary made clear on the radio this morning that she expected that that capacity would be used. I wanted to ask, what is the latest daily figures for the number of tests that are being carried out each day in Scotland and how do we get from that to three and a half thousand by the end of this week? Well, can I say briefly, because we will report more information around this uh, later this week. But let me just talk in general terms uh, right now. Uh, the three and a half thousand uh, target was around capacity for tests that will be met. I think that will be exceeded. But of course, it is important that if you have capacity, you use it. So we're focusing on how we maximise the use of, of that capacity right now. Uh, there are different uh, routes into testing uh, in Scotland now. There is the testing that is done through National Health Service uh, Laboratory Network, which of course has been expanding and increasing. Uh, there's also now the route uh, through the, the digital portal, um, that is the UK-wide digital portal through the, the drive through uh, testing centres and also some, although this is still quite limited, home delivery of tests. So in terms of that question, how, how many tests are being done in Scotland, uh, that is information that we will uh, look to report over uh, the next uh, few days, which will take account of all of the different routes uh, into testing uh, that exist. Increasingly, of course, uh, 
much of our thinking is how we get from, from where we are now into the even bigger expansion of testing capacity and also contact tracing capacity that we need for a test, trace, isolate um, approach, which, as you've heard me say before, will be a key component, not the only component, but a key component of the next phase of, of tackling the virus. Uh, Jean, do you want to say any more about uh, testing? So the, the other point I'd make is that um, when we reach the target towards the end of this month, uh, we will have gone from two labs that between them tested 350 uh, samples a day, that was what they were capable of doing, to 3,500. We will meet that number. The key is uh, to make sure that access to that testing is as smooth and straightforward and with a purpose. Uh, as uh, both the CMO and First Minister have said, that the point of testing uh, can shift as we move from where we are currently to uh, our plans and preparations for uh, any level of easing of the, the current restriction measures uh, at whatever point uh, those decisions might be taken. So we are ramping up both our capacity, but also looking very carefully at how we can improve access to that capacity so that we can meet that obligation in terms of test trace and isolate. From the Guardian. Thank you, First Minister. Just um, picking up on the question you were asked by a colleague a short while ago on the issue about um, joint working between the UK's different governments, the Four Nations strategy, um, do you believe that Scotland's Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officers should have full participation and membership rights on SAGE? Well, we know where the chair of uh, the advisory group here in Scotland does participate fully in SAGE and that has helped to, um, I think, deal with a deficiency um, that I certainly felt was, was there at the outset. Um, let me just explain a little bit more about why I thought it was important to establish that advisory group in Scotland. It's not a criticism of the advice uh, that is coming out of SAGE, which is of high quality and has been very helpful to us so far and will continue to be helpful. But there was two reasons at an earlier stage of dealing with this pandemic uh, that made uh, me think that I needed to augment uh, what was uh, coming out of SAGE. Uh, one was to make sure that what's coming out of SAGE is properly interpreted and understood in a Scottish context, uh, because you know it may not be the, the case always that what is required elsewhere in the UK is right for Scotland. So I wanted to be able to ensure that we were getting a more granular uh, view and interpretation of the data and the advice and the evidence. Uh, but secondly, so that I have an ability as as First Minister, as the, the chief decision maker in the Scottish Government, to uh, interrogate directly some of, of that uh, advice and to have somebody that I could ask questions of so that my understanding of it is, is uh, as it needs to be. And, and that wasn't, I felt, the case earlier on with SAGE. So now uh, with Professor Andrew Morris, who chairs uh, the group here in Scotland, participates in SAGE, I've got somebody that I can you know, ask questions. He's entirely independent and gives independent advice, but I have an ability to, to question and interrogate that so that I make sure I understand it properly. I understand any nuances in it. I understand any, you know, differences of opinion that might lie behind it. So those were the two reasons why not to be critical of SAGE, but to make sure that we built on that to give me as First Minister the kind of advice that I needed and the ability to interrogate that advice that led us to the position we're in now with the CMO advisory group here, which I, I think is, is a, a solid and sound position uh, for the decisions that lie ahead of us. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, 22 people, we learned today, have died at a care home in Eldersley. Yet the World Health Organization says anyone in a care home diagnosed with or having symptoms of COVID-19 should be transferred to hospital. Why is that not happening as a matter of course in Scotland, um, where our care home death rate appears at least to be far greater than that in England? Um, on that latter point, I, I don't think that will turn out to be the case. I mean, I, uh, I would say again, I'm not in a position to comment in detail on England's figures, but there are others who have questioned whether England's figures are right now giving a, a, a full account of that. 
the other point I would make, which I am, because it's a statement of fact, that the figures that NRS reports on a weekly basis, which include the percentage of deaths in care homes, is a week more up to date than the figures in England. So th there will also be a lag uh, there. In terms of the decisions about, uh, and I'll hand over to, to Gregor uh, as, as a doctor to answer this question, but the decisions, not just in relation to coronavirus, but on any illness as to whether somebody needs hospital treatment is a, a clinical decision. It should not be something that is decided as a matter of policy because while there will be uh, obviously people who contract this virus in care homes who do need and will benefit from hospital treatment, there may be others for whom a transfer to hospital would actually not be uh, in the best interests of, of their health and, and ongoing uh, management. So these decisions should not be made by somebody like me, these decisions should be made by clinicians uh, who have the ability to take all of the factors of an individual's uh, condition into account. Do you want to say a bit more about how that uh, will I think happen? I just want to, to, to again emphasise this point, that, that where there is um, a clinical need for any of our Scottish care residents to be treated in hospital, uh, that, that will happen. Um, the, the, the guidance is very explicit in those terms that, that actually the, the decision on where to treat those people should be a clinical decision based on the needs of that patient at that time and how they can best be met. And if that means that they need to be transferred to hospital for treatment because of the type of treatment that they need uh, in that environment, then, then, then that will happen. But, but it's also the case that actually it's very often much more appropriate for the type of care that these people really need is that that's best delivered in a place that's known to them by people who are able to care for them um, in, in, in their own environment. And as I say, we need to continue to make sure that that's delivered with the, 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 the kind of utmost um, uh, sense that, 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 that this is with a, very much with the patient's uh, needs in mind at all times. Thank you. Um, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. First Minister, um, it was just regarding the R0 transmission rate. Um, is there any indication that that's different region by region in Scotland? And is it possible the restrictions could be eased regionally? Um, I also just wanted to ask um, what this number needs to be before we can exit lockdown. Well, it needs to be as far below one as possible. We've not put a, a specific uh, on that yet, although that is part of the consideration uh, that is, is underway. Um, it is possible that the figure differs in, in different areas, but as I said uh, last Thursday, we, we would think that even although uh, what we estimate right now it is, is between 0 0.6 and, and 1 in care homes, for example, it's still likely to be higher than that. On the question about regional um, variations, I, you know, I made my position on this clear. If, if the evidence tells us that helps us to be more effective in combating the virus, then we will consider that. Uh, my preference from a, a, a perspective of being able to give clear and easy to understand messages to people is we have as much consistency as possible. And I think people can understand that. But as I keep saying here, my, my only consideration, whenever I'm judging or weighing up different things and reaching decisions, uh, my overriding consideration in all of this is, does this help us get this virus uh, down? Does this help us uh, stop people being admitted to hospital? Does this help us stop people dying from this virus? And I will always come at these decisions from, from that perspective uh, and not anything else. Uh, do you want to say any more about the R number? So, so I think the, all I would want to add to that is, is, is just that, that, that it's really important when we're considering the R number at any point in time is that we, we recognise that at this point in time there, there is still um, a little bit of uncertainty as to ex the exact nature of that R number at any point in time. So being able to estimate it on a sub-regional basis becomes um, slightly um, even less um, accurate than we would expect. So I think there are, um, I would have caution in, in, in breaking that down on a specific level at that until we've got much, much more data that's able to tell us more about it. It's also important to get the number of cases that we think there are down to the lowest level possible, um, as well as the rate at which then the virus is transmitting, because that is what gives you the ability uh, to, to contain going forward and then to use test, trace and isolate to try to uh, make sure you, you keep that containment. Alistair Grant from The Herald. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Um, an independent advisory group was set up 10 days ago to provide uh, expert economic advice to the Scottish Government uh, in response to the coronavirus crisis. I think at the time the Government said it would be led by Benny Higgins and Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli, uh, the, the latter being one of the first appointees, I think. 
Have further members been confirmed? And if so, who are they? Uh, and if they've not, when will they be appointed? Uh, the Economy Secretary will give further details on uh, both membership and the, the remit and what advice we're seeking from this group uh, over the course of the next few days. Um, this is a group that, you know, clearly, if it has advice for us in the short term, we will be uh, very much uh, keen to, to hear that. But this is a, a group that is intended to have a longer term uh, application as we come out of the acute phase. Of, of this pandemic into a phase where it's about rebuilding and perhaps reforming and uh, rebalancing the economy. So it's, it's a group that we would intend to be in operation for quite some time. Uh, Kathleen Nutt from The National. No, no Kathleen Nutt from The National. Um, Tom Martin from The Daily Express. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just going back to um, the Prime Minister's return to work, um, given your concerns about a uh, uh, premature end to lockdown in other parts of the UK, were you at all reassured by his cautious message this morning to the public to contain its impatience? Um, yes, I, I thought uh, the Prime Minister's message this morning uh, was, was appropriate and I, I think if you listen to what he said and to what I'm saying here, there's uh, a lot of alignment there in terms of we've made progress, but this next phase is one where we need to apply a very high degree of caution. Um, you know, I, I was saying, yeah, I, I'm not necessarily predicting we will get into a, a situation where the UK is, is lifting the lockdown in a way that I would think was premature. I've, I've, I've been asked in what circumstances would Scotland perhaps take a different path, and that is one of the illustrations I've, I've given. But I, I very much hope uh, that we continue to work as far as the, the evidence tells us is appropriate in alignment, uh, not least for the, the simplicity of, of messaging uh, that I've spoken about already. But I come back to the point I keep making. Uh, all that matters, and I'm pretty sure the same is true of, of Boris Johnson, all that matters, I, I don't want to be standing up here uh, reporting numbers of people in hospital, numbers of people in intensive care, and I certainly don't want to be standing up here reporting numbers of people dying from this virus for any uh, longer than I have to, and at levels higher than we have to. That is why Whatever it takes to get this virus down, that's what we should be focused on uh, and not this uh, normal political considerations that often uh, gets wrapped around some of the, uh, the decisions that we take. Simon Johnson, Telegraph. Um, a couple of weeks ago on these briefings, First Minister, I raised the issue of whether people would be able to go on their summer holidays this year. I just thought it would be worth raising again, given the information and the strategy you put out last week. Um, two questions, really. Um, the strategy sort of makes clear that social distancing will, will continue for some time to come. Will people be able to go onto airplanes and, and fly to foreign destinations? And secondly, the strategy calls for surveillance for people coming back into the country. And I just wondered whether that would be compatible with, you know, thousands of, of families flying back from, from their holidays. Um, look, what I said to you a couple of weeks ago when you asked me this question, um, which was that I, I wouldn't want to give people an expectation that summer holidays will happen as normal this year, hasn't changed. That remains uh, my view um, based on everything I, I know about the, uh, the, the difficult path that still lies ahead of us in, in this virus. But beyond that, I'm not going to get dragged into giving definitive answers and specific dates and timescales on things before we are able to do that uh, confidently and, and properly. So, uh, you know, if I said something a couple of weeks ago on this or anything else, and, and unless I've told you that's changed, then you can assume that it remains my, my position uh, going forward. Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. In The Times today, John Swinney said that uh, there's a plan being considered to bring pupils back to school earlier in August to give more classroom time, particularly if the virus takes off again in the winter months. Would this mean that the school summer holidays would be brought, the start of the school summer holidays would be brought forward to start perhaps at the start of June or the tail end of next month? And if so, is this plan predicated on pupils not going back to school until after summer holidays, whenever they may be? Right, that, that question was quite complicated. Uh, forgive me, uh, Kieran. I'm not sure I entirely followed the latter part of it. Um, I'll come back here to an answer I'm going to... You, you'll hear me give a lot, and it is actually part of the transparency that I've been speaking about. Um, often politicians uh, like to stand up and, and pretend they know the answer. Well, 
often we do know the answer to the questions we're being given, but sometimes to try to, to give that certain answer, even if you still have privately a bit of doubt about it, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, so my answer to all of these questions at the moment are maybe we are looking at different options about how we could safely start to restore some normality, including in terms of schools, without jeopardising uh, the objective of keeping the virus as suppressed as, as we need to, to keep it. Um, so we are looking at some options about you know, what could you do in terms of schools and, and how do we mitigate the, the loss uh, and interruption to children's education as we go. We've not taken firm decisions on any of this yet. I, I said in my opening remarks in the coming days as a, the next iteration of the document we set out last Thursday, we'll see a bit more about the specific options that we are considering None of that means that they will definitely happen anytime soon, but the options we're considering, how we're assessing them and what impact we think they would have on, on the virus. So we will, as we go, set out um, as much of this as we can. But ahead of us being able to do that, some of my uh, answers to these questions will continue to be, I don't know that yet because we're not yet at the position to answer it definitively. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Mail. Um, this question's for the health secretary, if that's all right. Um, yesterday you were asked about military pop-up testing facilities visiting care homes, and you said that that would happen. This morning on the radio you said that they won't be visiting care homes. Given the number of deaths and the spread of the virus in care homes, can you tell us when that will happen and if you hope it will happen and what led to that confusion? I, I don't think I was confused in what I said. The... Uh, pop-up mobile units are part of that uh, four-nation uh, testing program that includes the drive-throughs. Uh, they are there primarily to uh, enable increased testing of key workers. Uh, we have key workers in care homes, of course, and you'll recall that last week uh, we were very clear about the importance of care home workers being able to access testing, as with care at home workers, as well as uh, an increase in the testing of uh, residents in care homes who are symptomatic. That will primarily be done by our uh, NHS uh, local health protection teams uh, through the leadership of our public health directors, but where we need uh, that to be increased because a care home is in a particular area and the mobile unit is there, then we would of course sensibly use that mobile unit. It's about maximizing all the resources we have so that we maximize the capacity uh, and the use of the capacity that we have in testing. Uh, Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Um, First Minister, can I um, ask about NHS capacity? Can we quantify where we are, how far within capacity we are, if we like, to deal with potential um, surges? Do you have a figure in mind for where that would have to be before we look to move out of um, lockdown? And is it still the situation that you don't expect to have to use um, the Louisa Jordan? Um, I'll hand over to uh, the Health Secretary in uh, a moment, but we are uh, operating within uh, health service capacity uh, right now. Uh, the figures I've uh, reported on intensive care, which has always been uh, the, the part of NHS capacity we've most feared uh, being overwhelmed. Uh, our surge capacity for intensive care right now is uh, 585, and clearly uh, we are we are well within that. Yes, it remains our assessment at the moment that we will not need to use the NHS Louisa Jordan. That's always been our hope, uh, but of course we continue to monitor this uh, going forward. Um, my last point is is this: you know, yes, we need to make sure that our NHS is not and never becomes overwhelmed, and we stress that all along. But that's not the only objective around this. Uh, we also need to make sure um, that case numbers and the reproduction rate are as low as, as possible. Because if you were only going on NHS capacity, uh, you may you know, sort of think, well, there's a, a level of case numbers or a, a reproduction rate that we could tolerate that is higher uh, than as low as normal. So the NHS capacity point is important, but so too is driving case numbers and the reproduction rate as low as uh, we possibly can. We set out at the outset of uh, dealing with this pandemic, as I'm sure you remember, to create a bed uh, capacity in our hospital estate of 3,000 beds. That has been achieved. Uh, we also set out initially to double the number of intensive care beds, then to, uh, then to triple that, uh, which is where we are now with that surge capacity of 585. 
We have an objective to quadruple that, and we will continue to work towards that objective with the additional orders we have coming in for ventilators and the training that is there and ready for staff to do that. All of that is about ensuring that uh, we have the capacity to meet any surge in demand for healthcare because it goes back to that principal objective the First Minister has set out, which is to uh, save as many lives as we possibly can. Now, the additional uh, headroom that we might have at the moment is, as the numbers are, fragile, and we need to protect that headroom as we uh, continue to see how the virus uh, operates, how successful we all continue to be in meeting those restrictions and keeping case numbers down, uh, all of the measures that the First Minister set out. But we need to hold on to that capacity uh, as we work our way through what more needs to happen in terms of any easement at any point of the current restrictions. Uh, thank you. Adele Merson from the Evening Express. Minister, you said yesterday that Scotland could have a different exit from the lockdown if you felt the UK government had taken premature decisions. What actions would you deem premature currently? And have you actually identified any specific measures yet in, may, in which it may make sense for Scotland to diverge from the rest of the UK? Well, that will depend on the, the considerations and the process of decision making that we set out last week. That's why we set it out last week, so that we can take people through that on an iterative stage by stage uh, basis. And, you know, I'm not going to get into specifics right now, but if there was something that we thought it was really dangerous to do because it would uh, send send the, the virus potentially out of control again. And, and this is purely hypothetical. Um, and let me stress that I'm not saying that this is going to happen. If the government in London decided that it wanted to do that, then clearly there we would have a decision to make about doing something uh, different in Scotland. But this is hypothetical at the moment. Let me come back to, I, I, I kind of, on one level, in a, a traditional sense, understand why people want me to lead off on what am I going to do differently or what am I not going to do differently? But with the greatest of respect, and I've made this point so many times before, that is the wrong starting point. The starting point, the only starting point that matters is what helps us keep this virus under control. And the steps that we take or don't take flow from that. Um, and that's how I will make decisions at every stage of this process. And as I make those decisions and as we consider those decisions, as I said last week, we will set out the basis for that very openly and transparently so we can have that grown-up conversation with the public that I've said I'm so keen to have. Uh, Paul Malik from The Courier is the last question. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, our question is on uh, statistics and why the Scottish Government hasn't published uh, statistics on coronavirus um, by ethnicity and when you plan doing so. Um, we've seen that in England there is a disproportionately high number of people dying from BME backgrounds of the virus to the point of where even NHS staff in England and Wales are being advised on, on sort of precautions they can take and being monitored uh, for illness. Are there plans to introduce that in Scotland also? I'll hand over on the ethnicity point, which is a very important point to, to Gregor, to talk about the work we are part of to try to understand that more. On, on the point about statistics generally, uh, I always want us to be publishing more if we can, and we will continue on an ongoing basis to consider that. I would point to um, an academic uh, piece that was published last week, though, um, and I certainly can make this available if people are interested, um, where uh, the comment made about the Scottish data was that it was, and I quote, exemplary in terms of the amount and the quality of data that we are publishing to try to build as, as much of an understanding as possible uh, about the, the spread and the progress of this virus. Gregor, do you want to take the ethnicity point? Yeah, I mean, I think, as, as First Minister said, this is a really important point. There's, there there's, there's certainly appears to be a signal coming through that um, there's over-representation of certain ethnic groups in some of the um, the research data that's coming through, particularly from um, more severe cases and, and from ICU admissions. That's, that's primarily come from a lot of the experience in the initial uh, stages of the, the, the London epidemic and, and um, the, there's clearly a need to try to understand this in, in, in a much more degree way. There are lots of factors which makes this data difficult to understand at, uh, at the moment and that's why working with the other CMOs across the UK we've commissioned specific research uh, to be able to try to better understand exactly what this data is telling us and, and, and um, whether there are any actions that, that flow from that data as well. It's a signal that we've seen not just here in the UK but we've seen in other countries 
countries as well. And um, I know that there are links established with other European countries who are also looking at this type of data as well. And, and I think my, my, my message here is, is that where there is reliable data that we can uh, openly publish. Um, we will always seek to do that, but, but it needs to be uh, reliable data that's available to us and that's meaningful in, in the way that it's presented. Thank you, Gregor. Um, that, that concludes the, the questions we have today, so can I uh, draw today's update to a close by thanking you again uh, for joining us. Um, I can see that it's uh, sunny outside today, which I know makes it much more difficult to ask you to continue to stay at home, but I hope I've demonstrated with uh, Jean and Gregor today the importance of continuing to stick with these measures. They are working, we are seeing that progress, but it would be all too easy to reverse it. And then all that would mean is that we have to have these very severe restrictions in place for even longer. So please uh, stick with it. Thank you so much for what you're doing so far. And we'll see you here tomorrow at the normal time of 12.30. Thank you very much.